West Point 2615 was <laughs> cut. <laughs> <laughs> My highlight of West Point was seeing all the ama- amazing healings that Jesus has done. Uh, I enjoyed the Elven Dragons football team finally getting past the first round. <laughs> Huge success. Involving my face getting smashed with a ball. Another part of my body we won't mention getting smashed with a ball. Uh, and I enjoyed the Elven Dragons quiz team winning the quiz title for the third year in a row. It's three years running, so we are the three year reigning quiz champions of West Point. Elven Dragons rule. <laughs> and. Probably more importantly, uh, I really enjoyed Andrew Wilson who was speaking about the disease of individualitis, which I definitely suffer from at times, uh, and the challenge to just believe and serve uh, the church and all work together to build the wall and grow as a church together. On the first night, um, the first meeting, it was in the evening, and it was really good. The, the song, um, the songs were really nice. Um, they, it, it, there was a lot of um, like response time throughout the week and. It was really fun, especially being with all our church family. This year was my first time at West Point and uh, it's definitely given me a different perspective on camping in general. I really liked the music, I learned a lot of cool new songs and um, we saw amazing healings and the power of Christ. My highlight is um, going to the West Point kids group, five to seven, because it's really fun. You get to do craft, uh, singing. Can't think of anything else really. I think the biggest highlight for me was yesterday at a seminar um, where one of the uh, group leaders had um, words from God for me and was very touched by the Holy Spirit and definitely has brought me closer to God and I'm much more aware now of when he's talking to me Um, and that's just been a true blessing. Because I like to when Kevin said fell over and it went in his tent. (laughs) On the first night Dave Smith spoke and he spoke about Joseph and how there was a long time of preparation before he was Prime Minister of Egypt. And uh, he spoke about dreams and I've had lots of dreams and in a sense, sometimes when you get as old as I am, uh, you wonder if those dreams will ever happen. But it really sort of affirmed that sometimes God takes a long time to prepare before you can actually have those dreams come true. And it just really rebuilt my faith again. So it was an excellent night. I helped out with the ARC this year at West Point, which is the special needs children. And we saw lots of children uh, being healed there. One boy who couldn't see very far at all, had very thick glasses. He was able to see the stage ahead of him and he burst into tears. It was all very emotional and uh, amazing to be part of. My highlight of West Point was um, Saturday night when all the youth had like a meeting. And it was amazing because everyone got touched by the Holy Spirit and I remember after we all went out and had a silent disco and we had the best time because everyone was so happy. (laughs) I think mine was also the uh, Saturday night actually um, just because I um, was touched by the Holy Spirit and it was the first time I've probably been touched by the Holy Spirit in a very long time. And I felt a sense of peace that I couldn't, I just couldn't explain in a way that I just started crying and laughing and um, it felt really significant to me. Uh, so my West Point highlight has actually been getting to know people. I feel that I'm going back with stronger relationships and um, have made memories um, with people that I hope will um, last for a long time. It's been a pleasure to be in West Point today. We wanted to come here to worship God and we had a lot of fun in our very own very good kids meeting. Sung some great songs, did some preaching and drama. Lots of great stuff to enjoy. And 2016 West Point is going to be really nice and we hope the weather can change a lot. The highlight of me coming to West Point was just seeing the community and the genuine love that everyone just had here. Uh, When I got here, I just was being embraced and hugged, but I was being hugged for real. 
and it just made me so emotional because uh, you guys have truly shown what true family means and I've never felt such immense love and uh, not in my entire life. So, love you guys. I'm really sorry. I thought I had to do that at the end. Uh, my highlight of X uh, of West Point has been to teach Tara to do that pretend X one <laughs> which none of us actually do. Oh, just oh, everything from the kids' work, um, everything from like, the worship, the games, the um, challenges, all of all of that sort of stuff, and the festival that was that was good. The, uh, the highlight of my weekend uh, during West Point has been uh, watching uh, my closest friend come to know Jesus more and to make a commitment to giving her life to Christ. Um, it's, I didn't think I could feel this happy <laughs> about, about most things and I just thank God that he has used this weekend to, to bring my friend to know him and to uh, teach me more about his amazing love. Okay, uh, my highlight for West Point Probably uh, being part of the X1 uh, football team, the uh, Elvin Dragons. Uh, we got to the quarterfinals. It was a great effort. It was a great um, turnout for the whole of X1. We come and support, and it was just great to be a part of. Never heard of them before. Okay, so my favourite highlight was Saturday evening, and that's because we saw so many people's lives being changed. Yes, um, uh, so Saturday evening everyone was just touched by the Holy Spirit and um, everyone was just crying and like on the floor and we were all like really touched and it was amazing just seeing what God can do. What did you enjoy about West Point? Singing the songs. My highlight is a bit weird, so I ended up in A&E. &E. Um, but before getting there, I was asked by someone whether I wanted to go home the next day and I said, no way, that's the highlight, no way, I'm staying here, I'm not going to be picked off because Guy Miller had just done a talk and he was talking about people who were ill being picked off and I was going to glorify God by staying here and I am so glad I did, it's been amazing. I served in the Fours for Jesus, um, we saw lots of lovely things but one funny thing I want to tell you about is um, the last day we were doing about sharing. We had the loaves and the fishes story. And then the children had to lay on the floor, listen to what God wants to tell them. Then they came up and shared. One little boy came up and said, God told me to bring a snack. <laughs> <laughs> My highlight is, um, yeah, just really being together as a family to be able to spend time with people that maybe don't normally hang out with. Um, and just have an amazing time talking about God with loads of people, um, praying with the youth, getting to hang out at the seaside with loads of different people. Um, it's just been an amazing time of family together. Just served about 100 burgers uh, in the last couple of hours. Uh, been a great West Point, loved it. Loved, most of all, just loved us being together as a church. I think we really felt from the moment we got here, we were just all together. And the first morning we called everyone to pray. And usually, last year we got about eight people. This year we had like the entire campsite. So about 45 people turn up to pray. And then the next next two mornings too and it's just been wonderful. Uh, we've had salvation in our midst, that's the biggest news probably of all. Uh, just enjoyed everything about it, much uh, much of the word's been about sort of knowing your role, knowing your part in the big story and I think that's uh, consistent with where we feel we are as a church too. Last night was amazing, we were in the Holy Spirit, we were all pouring with tears in the youth. We, I spoke in tongues out loud like at the front for the first time. Um, yeah, our whole youth group was just on fire and we prayed for Dan Foster and his back got completely healed and that was among other, like we've prayed for other people since and they've been partially healed or completely healed, it was, it's amazing. My highlight of West Point would have probably been being touched by God and the worship's really fun and the kids group because it was really fun and the place is just amazing. West Point 2015 was a truly remarkable event especially because of the message we heard yesterday that how important every single person is in building the kingdom of God. I will never ever underestimate what I can contribute to the kingdom. It doesn't matter how small it is. What matters is that I'm committed to serving Jesus Christ and serving X1. God bless you all.
in uh, normal football, the penalty spot is 36 feet away from the goalkeeper, yeah? And it's sort of kind of about a bit of power and accuracy. In kind of five-a-side football, it's about 10 inches away from you. It's about six feet. And the general tactic is to slam it as hard as you possibly can at this poor mark, i.e. me, stood in a goal. And basically, you have no time to react to the goalkeeper. So your technique is just to shut your eyes and throw yourself and make yourself as big as you can and take the hit. I took one really cracking half football into the face and another even harder football not into my face. Let's just, let's just say that's as much as you need to know. But it really hurt. And then 10 seconds later you've got to get in goal and save another one. And now you're frightened, yeah? Now, now fear has gripped you, so you're praying, fear, leave my body, Holy Spirit, take it away. I saved a lot, but our team can't score for time. We missed so many penalties. You scored, yeah, yeah, but we all missed them. We got knocked out in the quarterfinals, but mate, this is the cheap. Um, on the video front, by the way, we are, actually, if you look at the actual West Point video, uh, for the West Point highlights, uh, several members of X1 feature in that video. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, you can see it on Vimeo. It's great. Um, there is a moment which is quite amusing, though, isn't there, Hannah? <laughs> so Jessica and Hannah actually speak in the West Point video, and they say to Jess and Hannah, "So how did what did you?" And Jess says something like, "You know, it's great. I really time together with my friends and growing in Christ." And it went to Hannah, and at that point, Hannah thought Jess has just said what I was going to say. So she then said, "I, I grew in Christ." And I learned new skills. <laughs> and we've all been going, what skills did you actually learn how? Basically how to hold it in during the night, I think is one of the things. <laughs> how to brush your teeth at minus eight degrees centigrade. What, what new skills did you actually learn? So please quiz her throughout the rest of the day and try and figure out what new skills she learned during my school. I love you, Hannah. Uh, I love you so much. Second daughter, I can take the neck. All right, so uh, we are into uh, just a short series uh, on, on sort of visions. We're coming out of something like the, the, not just West Point, of course, because not everyone was there, but coming out of the, the summer period of just lots of different things going on. We like to sort of just say, so let's talk a bit about vision for the church. So if you don't know who I am, my name's Andy, by the way, one of the elders um, here on with Aaron and Dan. And... Um, We'll be back in our series of Acts, but we call this series uh, 4G. So the 4G is of the church, you'll see it um, mentioned down there. So the 4Gs are go. The gospel is what we are here for. It's the foundation on which we build everything else. Gather. Gathering is core to us. Community outside of just Sunday mornings, more than the, just that in the midweek group. Church is life together in community. Giving of ourselves, our times, our resources to serve the community and our fellow human beings. And all of it to glorify Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to be speaking about. Really echoing a bit. Um, so, yep, yeah, so let's, uh, we're going to go into the go one today. So, and the overriding theme, ironically, and I say that with a tongue in my cheek, cheek, because you know when God's kind of moving in the church, is to talk about how, what the role we all play in it. How we individually play a part in that role. That was on our hearts and minds when we were at West Point. It's become a theme that a lot of people have taken away from West Point. So not a single member of this church, X1, should feel excluded from the vision. Neither should they underestimate the part that each single one of us played in this amazing story and this mission we've called to. I want to remind us of something. It's a word I've brought back a few times. It's not unique to this church. But when it was spoken over this church, we hadn't heard it before. And it's this thing about being a battleship over a cruise liner. And I just want to bring it back to, this, to our vision again here. Battleships have no passengers. Battleships, everyone on the ship plays a role in the journey and the mission of that ship. From the person scrubbing the deck to the captain of the ship. Everyone has a role to play. You don't have sunbeds on the deck of a battleship so people can catch some rays, yeah? Whereas cruise liners, obviously you've got a, a small number of people that you don't really see doing all the work, and the majority of people just sitting on the deck. We're not that. We are to be a battleship church, which means everyone understanding that we play a fundamental part, and were we not to do our bits, a part of what God has called us to would therefore struggle, and the overall mission itself would struggle. So I want to keep that in mind, because we want to talk continually through this series about the part we all play in in this big story. So, uh, this looks like an HSB ad to me. HSBC ad to me. Sorry about that. But, um, 
Let's talk about this 4G. So I'm going to start off by, uh, I'm going to call this first bit under the Spurgeon's knife. If some of you know who he is, we'll talk about who he is in a minute if you don't. Um, now let me just start. I'm going to get a little bit, angry will be the wrong word, but forceful at times during this, uh, this time. I've got a problem a little bit with kind of vision series in a way. So to me, it's wrong to expect us, sort of once or twice a year as elders, to roll out some kind of new vision for this church that somehow rejuvenates our enthusiasm uh, for the church, keeps us connected, keeps us motivated. I have a bit of a problem with that sometimes, that that's what we expect vision to be about. Let's just try something else to kind of just re-fire ourselves into a new way of thinking. I was actually a little bit put out, to be honest with you. I got a, saw a Twitter feed come in, uh, I think it was Friday, it might have been yesterday, saying, that's it. Hashtag West Point 15 is over. Time to look forward to 2016 now. So I'm still trying to just enjoy what an amazing time it was. Now, I yeah, I understand the sentiment. I'm fully with that. But what about now? What about the fact that we've just come back to our uh, churches and communities? And it should be about... So if God's met with us as a community, it should be something that impacts us right now. Not just thinking, wow, that was great. I hope in 12 months time I get another dose of that. No, if you're at some, anything like this, it needs to impact now. And it kind of feeds a little bit into a consumer-led culture that we live in. That's so easy to become quite passive, sort of expecting the church itself to do the work. Blame the church or its leaders for lacking vision. We lose heart because we're no longer really feeling it anymore. We stop attending quite as much. We whisper over coffee that the, the leaders have lost direction and decide we're not motivated by them. So let's look at an online preacher who's really great and really inspirational in Atlanta. You know, forgetting that there's someone working really, really hard in Barnsley. I'm sorry if you come from Barnsley, I'm comparing it like two ends of the scale there. But I always want to stamp my foot one more time. That was okay, it's not as noisy without the stage. But I have never, ever lost direction for Jesus Christ. I will never, ever lose direction for Jesus Christ. We elders focus our vision and our hearts on Jesus Christ and we will never ever ever lose direction if we, unless we take our eyes off him and we will focus on him till we die. There's the vision for us. Jesus Christ glorified in our lifetime is the thing that will never come out of my gaze and when it does drift from vision I have to pull myself back to it. We will never lose that vision and everything that builds off the back of that We could lose momentum, that happens, but not missional direction. For losing missional direction, we have no excuse. It could be arrogance or ignorance that causes it. And we can't be responsible for any potential arrogance, perhaps, of saying I'm not interested in where that is, but we could be responsible for some potential not knowing, the lack of clarity to what you, me, the church, and this church are primarily called to do. So I'm going to quote this truly directional creature, this guy called Charles Spurgeon, who many will know, but I hope some of you don't, and I hope some of you don't because you're new to the faith, or you're seeking to find out about the faith, and therefore names like Spurgeon mean nothing. That would be good news, there are people in here going, who the heck is he? And we could explain because you're exploring, you're seeking, you're looking to find out more about Jesus Christ and who he is. And Charles, has, for those of you who don't know who he was, um, He's a, a Victorian preacher, late 19th century preacher, teacher, described as one of the most effective evangelists, evangelists of all time, and the prince of preachers. He was based in London. He drew thousands to hear him preach uh, the gospel and to teach leaders. He was brutally forthright, uh, probably, you know, now would be seen as an absolute, you know, out of control, but he was brutally forthright. He just said it as it was, totally opposed to the soft selling of the gospel, and yet he married that with an absolutely fierce, unquestionable love for people. So he was brutally honest, but he just he was reported to be truly pastoral. He loved people, but he got angry about misrepresentation, soft selling of the gospel. I aspire to something like that. If I could get that balance in my mind, it would be great. I could be uncompromising and challenging while you all know that I'm truly loving and I, I pray that's what you get. You get that kind of, yeah, dearly, slack, but I love you dearly and let me do whatever I can to help. So 
So in the first lecture series that he uh, did, one, one called Soul Winning, he did a whole lecture series, uh, Spurgeon. That's a picture of him there up in the corner. You never find one of him smiling. I've looked, so he just generally looks a bit somber. But he starts this whole series called um, Soul Winning. And he makes this quote right at the very, very beginning of the entire series. He says, Soul Winning is the chief business of the Christian minister. Indeed, it should be the main pursuit of every true believer. We read that one more time. Soul winning is the chief business of the Christian minister. Indeed, it should be the main pursuit of every true believer. Spurgeon then goes on to link that to a scripture that I actually ended my last preach. I did one on kind of social media and the internet. Um, and that preach is really going to be fundamental in this 4G series, particularly this one about God. Uh, it is 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. It's up there, I'll read it for you as well. This is written by Paul. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, that not myself, not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things, all people, that by all means, all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. A wonderful piece of scripture. Spurgeon told the gathered at this event all this time ago, he said, be like Simon Peter and say, I go fishing. And be like Paul and say, that I might save some. So, beloved, the primary mission of Christ first is that we might save some. And so the core vision of this church does need to be one of growth, one of swelling numbers, one of multiple locations, yes, but that's the outcome. That's the outcome, not the input. Our vision is not to grow. Our vision is that we might save many. And then... You see the growth come. You see those things come off the back of that. A result, not the aim. So if you take time as a leader to read Soul Winning, Spurgeon's book, and some of the, the things that are in it, you'll notice, though it's in very, very Victorian language, very hard to read at times, you have to really filter it because it's written in a, an old form of English, um, the topics feel like they were written yesterday. They're very close to kind of current reality of how people view church. And that surprises me. Kind of all that time ago, when you look at it now, he talks about the church hopper, the kind of people like that. He talks about the consumerist church attender. He talks about lethargic Christians. He talks about people with loads of ideas but no drive. Those are on fire and they're ice cold. Shallow preaching. People that follow thin words. And a lack of the general recognition of sin. All that time ago. You think, wow, that... Read like it was written yesterday, and yet it seems to be we thought back then everyone was kind of more aware, but no, he reflects a very real situation. He also had no interest in statistics. Um, he knew they were necessary, he recognized their purpose, but he was only ever interested in winning souls. <clears throat> he berated churches that were, were driven by numbers and growth. He wanted them to be, and he said, You can fill your pews with people with you know this kind of idea of mile wide, inch deep. You know, I kind of get the basics and that's enough and we're in. And it would be very challenging to those that would sell a soft gospel that wouldn't even talk about sin and wouldn't mention it. And people would go to the church and actually you would question whether they were even saved. Brutally honest. So let's look at an enduring vision. So what I want to say is that I need to change. We need to change. We need to shift the good news of Jesus Christ to the front of our personal and corporate vision and just keep it held right there. Then we build or we rebuild or we refresh our vision but everything hanging off of that in the dead centre of everything we do that we might save some. The vision of this church is to keep us all pointing to Jesus. To get you and me to fix our eyes solely on him and work everything else back off of that. And it's funny because I wrote it here. Uh, and then Tolson changed the, changed the, uh, says it this morning a bit. And then about the role we all play. And then on the video you've got 
is kind of in the name, guys. Christ first, yeah. It's kind of you don't. If you need a reminder, just remember what we're called. It's in the name of the church. So in order to do this, I'm going to try and cut through a lot of waffle, not a ton of time today, and lay out what I actually mean by adapting a hymn. Uh, and then we'll come back to what it actually means here and for X1 on the ground today, tomorrow, and the years to come. Remember, this is one of three vision messages, so you've got to hear them all before you kind of get the whole picture. I'm just going with one particular section. But like I said at the beginning, we should not be sharing vision, uh, visional changes on some kind of an annual basis. This needs to be long-lasting, like permanent, like this hymn has always been. And it still feels a great hymn today. But the reason I'm adapting it is simply because it's hard to understand in its current English form. So in case you're thinking it's heresy to kind of adapt an old hymn, please know that this one is on its fourth version anyway. The version of it we sing, it was an 8th century Irish hymn, not written in English, so you wouldn't have been able to read it, called, I probably pronounced this completely wrong, Rock to Mobile. That's what this one was actually called originally. It got translated, adapted twice, set to music, adapted again, and then into the version we probably know today. <clears throat> you might guess what it is, it's Be Thou My Vision, yeah, which probably many of us have heard, if not some. I've adapted it into a declaration and a prayer. So it won't rhyme for a start, so I don't three rhymes. At the end of the day, at the end of today, I'm going to ask if you're willing to stand and pray this prayer with me. But for now, I'm just going to read it out and let you kind of absorb it. And I pray that by the power of the Spirit, it is more than a rewording. It reaches us in a different way because it's been around for a long time. So when you see it on the left, you'll see the hymn. And on the right, you'll see my adaptation of it into a prayer. And I'm going to pray it out. So let me pray. I'm going to pray it for me. I'm going to pray it over us. And then later on, we're going to pray it together. Lord, be my vision. Over and above all things. Be the focus of my thoughts. Be with me in every moment of life. Walk with me, Father. Lord, help me to know your ways. Teach me by your word. Help me to grow closer and closer to you. I lay aside all this earthly life has to offer in favour of eternal life with you. I put you first, my Lord, my King, my treasure. I thank you that on the cross you won the battle over sin. With joy I look to seeing you in glory in heaven. I love you with all my heart because you love me with all of yours. No matter what happens in this life, please stay in my vision, ruler of all. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, the Saviour King, should be enough vision for all of us to hold on to. As in that first verse, it sort of says, in the original it says, Naught be else to me, save that thou art. Which I've adapted into over and above all things, be the focus, you know, those sorts of words. It's when we lose focus on that, we kind of lose focus on almost everything. And Spurgeon would be more brutal than me. I know I'm probably underplaying it, but the primary purpose of X1 and hence your eldership is not to focus on us, me, or you, so that you can therefore love Jesus. It's to focus on Jesus so we can all love better. Love ourselves, love one another, and love every lost soul in this town, this nation, and this world. You see, soul winning changes everything. Soul winning extends just beyond the winning of the lost. It impacts on the suffering, it impacts on the poor. While keeping Jesus in the focus. This is because of who he is. We look to this total servant, the Lord of all, who being himself God, makes himself man. He comes to the aid of everyone. He weeps for those who suffer. He cares for those in need. He fights injustice. He destroys class and social boundaries. He has no prejudice over race, gender, or social standard. He, standing. He does all he can to help anyone he can. He couldn't fix the world in that first moment, yet, but he can mend the broken hearted and fix us in eternity. In Philippians 2, Paul puts it so powerfully. Do nothing 
from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and on the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians reminds us that we are not here for ourselves. We have not been saved just to languish in the joy of knowing that we are okay, that we dodged the bullet of sin. We have to see that. In being saved, we look to Jesus and what he did and we immediately become concerned about others as well. It starts with the lost. It has to start there. Our primary aim is that we can do all we can to share the gospel, to help whoever we can see Jesus. It's what we were praying this morning before we did. They would see Jesus. That everything we do gets our eyes of those who believe and those who don't to see Jesus. But it gets accompanied then by works. It, it's, it is about looking out for those in distress, keeping ourselves pure. So if you want to know what a true believer of Christ looks like, if you read some scripture, it'll tell you it's someone who looks out for people in distress and looks to keep themselves pure. Unstained by the world, James would put it. I don't want to get too far off track, especially with the time left, because um, I want to focus on the gospel and bring that out. But I also want to talk about something that's kind of an issue in our culture now and kind of feeds into things where people want to laugh at or berate Christianity. True believers of Christ serve those in distress. It's one of the primary outworkings of our faith. To put others in front of ourselves, serve those in distress. Right? You agree with that? Amen. The scripture agrees with me. This country is not a Christian country anymore. And it saddens me deeply, to be honest with you. The fact that so many people are lost in sin, yes, but it saddens me because you can evidence it in the way that we respond to certain things. We can't seem to figure out, it's taken us forever to figure out how we do something about this refugee crisis. And it saddens me so deeply because it's held up by so much to be considered. And yet we should have done something by now. I was praying before, I was prepping, I had this deep conviction. I was, look, I was watching about what Austria was doing and watching the community. They were showing community, people coming out, meeting these refugees and giving them blankets and everything they could. But it's, and, they, and they asked them, where are you going? And they interviewed loads of them. They were saying, we're going to Germany, we're going, we're going to try and stay in Austria, we're going here. They said, no one said the UK. The word had got around that you won't be particularly welcome there. You probably won't be particularly careful, but if you're around here, they'll look after you. That saddens me so deeply. It's part of some collective failing in our country. I know we must do more. We've got opportunities to do more. We'll probably share something with you through an email shortly about a collection that's going on to, in Watford to provide aid to people in Calais. We need to be part of that. But I also feel the weight of some of the, the lack of just love and desire for humanity and humility in our whole country now. We do give a lot of money to charity. We do. I read about it this morning. We, I think in four days we've given something like 500 million now since we saw that image of that boy on the beach. <coughs> children, uh, not children in need, it's one of the other children's um, charities. We've given that. And that's amazing, but we spent 810 million on that day. Remember Black Friday? Yeah. 810 million in one day on stuff. It is the departure from my main point. But not, not totally, because what I'm saying is more Christians equals more people serving, less suffering, more action. It's the model of who Jesus Christ was. So the more people that truly believe, the less of this stuff we see 
in the refugee crisis, and we realise how horrid that's become. And the country could change. It really could change. If the main pursuit of every true believer is the winning of souls, we are not doing it so we can claim terms of big church, multi-meeting, multi-site, look how great we are. It's so much bigger than that. More souls won. Not only means that a person is saved from sin and eternal separation from God and the light of eternity, it means the world just gets better. Go IJM, go things like that. The world gets better when Christians look to Jesus and say, and now we do something. But you have to see him first. And you say, he did everything he could. He laid his own life down. And therefore we can do the same. So ironically, it is an HSBC uh, once a slogan. But my last point is this one. Think globally, act globally. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's our task. It's kind of on our job description. It's bullet point number one. You know, what do you have to do? Well, you have to do this. That's what you're supposed to do. It's not to make believers, but to make followers, disciples, followers. Yeah? Life-changing moment, not some one-off event. We're to go and win souls for Jesus. When a soul is one, a life is changed, and the world does get that little bit better. So here's where I'm going to transition a bit to what it means for X1, Christ first, and our vision, like I said, it's one of three. So not so much about the long term, but about the application, the implications today, in the months ahead, and the years to come. The commission is to go and win souls of all the nations, and we are involved in that. As many of you know, we are involved in some international work here. So we're looking to uh, extend out into Texas, as you already know, Simon's out there. We've got the Browns going to Cairo. That's absolutely amazing. That's one part of the story. And that's right when we see people go out into the nations. It's amazing. However, it's pretty much the thing that's dictated many of the decisions that me and my wife have made for the last 20 years. There's a nation that really, really needs a lot of help and a powerful gospel outpouring. You know I mean this nation, right? And there's a town I know where you see thousands and thousands of souls that need to be won. If it were to happen as it did for Spurgeon and others when they see complete revival break out, it's happened, it does happen. The revival breaks out. This town could be an epicenter for good in the town. The nations and beyond. You know I mean this town, right? And there's this church. There's about 130 people who gather regularly in it. And those blessed individuals have the ability to win souls that would affect the town and so affect the nation and so affect the world. Amen. You know what I mean? That's right. Amen. And St. Luke's and the World Street and Derby Road, Amen. West Watford Community Church and, and, and. A word that was given, to God, uh, given by God to a church in Peterborough, which is now a, a, a really just healthy, exploding, large church, kind of part of what we said, it's full of people of deep faith, but it's absolutely huge, a guy called David Smith shared about this at West Point, the word that they were given was this, if you don't love the place, you'll never reach the people. If you don't love the place, you'll never reach the people. So I'm challenging you, love Watford, love it, because if you don't love it, we won't reach the people. And don't love it for endearing features of whatever it's got, because it, you struggle to find them. <laughs> <laughs> love it because Christ loves it. Amen. And it's full of lost people that he would Amen. love to see you saved. Amen. Here's my nightmare scenario. That we neglect this nation and its needs for the gospel. So much in 30 years' time, some part of the world is talking about sending pioneers in. Perhaps to go to a place called Watford that no one's heard of. Because we need to send some pioneers in there to take the gospel in. That on our watch we slumber, we let it slip through our fingers and we blame the government, we blame the schools for the loss of faith. We didn't do enough to share it ourselves. One on one with the people that we know. We didn't love Watford enough. I don't want myself to be that person and I'm challenging myself deeply as so I'm standing with you on this one. To stand by some drowning man and say, someone should really help him, you know. I'd rather drown trying to help him 
And that's tugging at my heart at the moment. That question, would I really drown to save the drowning man? I'd like to think so, but I'm being challenged at the moment to say, my nation is drowning and I'm not doing enough to try and stop it drowning. Jesus did. Jesus saved every drowning person. And that town is drowning. So what about us? Alright, so we are the gospel carrying, soul winning people. If we look to Jesus who put everything else before himself and we just take on 10% of that nature and did all we can that we might save some. Why don't we say that together? That we might save some. We're going to make sure that Sundays continue and probably increase to be more and more about sharing the gospel. We've said that amongst us. We want to see more, Steve, more people coming in and saying, what about this? And not going out going, didn't really get it. We want that moment to be, and we want that to be part of a feature of our Sunday mornings, but it's not just about Sunday mornings. No, 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 it can't be just about that. You're going to hear more about in this 4G series. But because in this ever-changing world we live in, you can give it a try. So let me know that. In this ever-changing world we live in, you can all give it a try. Watford is actually changing very fast, and I'm sure you've noticed. We need to realise Sunday is a place of gathering that's no longer the central feature of our community. This place is not the central focus of the community. We can pray it will be, and maybe one day it will be, but right now it is no one's going to wander in because they walk past and went, oh, there's a church in there. It just won't happen. It's not that way anymore. It happens because we speak to people and we invite them here. Every one of us, me included, needs to get far better at being able to share the gospel. And that needs two things. And the first one is really the huge one, of course, which is the Holy Spirit. The removal of fear, the power to discern when to share, as well as the boldness and the anointing when we do. That is provided, provided by the Spirit of God. So we need to pray more for that. That's one of the things that holds us back. We don't pray that. We just think we've got to get it eloquent and forget that the power of the Spirit is doing 90% of the work. But here's our part of it. The desire and the readiness to share that gospel. Look at David and Goliath, for example. You've got this little, this huge, loud-mouthed opponent taunting this boy, and yet by the power of God, he's taken down with one shot. Mm. Oh, for that faith, that power, in the Goliath-like opposition to the gospel at the moment. For that, it would be amazing. And on that second one there from us, many of us, and I think I'm challenging myself too still at the moment, given the chance, I'm not actually quite ready to share the gospel, to lay it down straight in front of someone. So I gave myself a challenge, and I'm working on it. And I tried the same. Half page of A4. Someone says to you, because you've managed to get that conversation, so what is it you believe? Remember, that person does not know Christianese. We've got to be able to share it in some way that gets the gospel across powerfully and simply, whilst not underselling it. And when you do that, it's quite a challenge. Have a go to Right out, this is what I would say if someone just asked me that question. Get ready, hone it. Be always ready to give account. So let's close, and we're going we're to read that prayer out in a minute. And I do need the band back up, that's all right. I know we're running a little bit over, but we'll do it, and then you can lead through the song if you need to. Might have been an incohesive bunch of stuff, it might be cohesive to you, a mixture of both, I don't know. But let's just summarize it for you to see. And I'm going to share something with you. The main pursuit of all believers is to win souls. The enduring vision of this church is to fix our eyes on Jesus. Winning souls does more than save. It changes the world for the better, one bit at a time. We change the world by changing our town. So we're going to close out by doing something very uh, Church of England kind of thing. Uh, we don't do very often. We're going to pray together. Okay, let's go. Lord... Be my vision over our all things. Be the focus of my thoughts. Be with me in every moment of life. Walk with me, Father. Lord, help me to know your ways. Teach me by your word. Help me to grow closer and closer to you. I lay aside all this earthly life has to offer in favour of the 
eternal life with you. I put you first, my Lord, my King, my treasure. I thank you that on the cross you won the battle I received with joy and live to see in glory in heaven. I love you with all my heart which you should love me with all of yours. No matter what happens in life, please stay in my vision. Will work for me.